Well, that little uh, delay has put us all in really good humour here. <laughs> Welcome to Kingston Environment Centre for the 12th anniversary of Kingston Green Radio. When Kingston Green Radio started, it was a, a little offshoot of Kingston Green Fair, and then we moved into a, a small uh, studio at the back of an industrial unit. And now here today we are at Kingston Environment Centre and uh, playing a mixture of, uh, an eclectic mixture of music and some wonderful webcasts and broadcasts to do with the environment. And you'll, you'll find uh, that uh, you can get us by uh, tuning in to Kingston Green Radio. Just put that into your web browser and you'll find us. Um, so you found us today and uh, Henry's going to take us forward with the, uh, with the wonderful green debate. Uh, Henry is our version of David Dimbleby or Fiona <laughs> Bruce. We're not quite <laughs> sure yet. We'll find out. Henry, take it away. Right, can you hear me all okay? Is that all okay? Brilliant, well thank you very much for coming, thank you very much if you're listening at home. Um, of course we've got listeners on the on the website which is www.gffradio.org.uk and we've got a, a small uh, studio audience as well, just to prove uh, that we do have a studio audience. <laughs> if you wouldn't mind putting your hands together for our fantastic panel this evening please. Brilliant. Um, and just throughout the debate, if I am looking at my phone, I'm looking at any tweets or texts that we are that we are getting in. So don't worry, I'm not uh, Snapchatting or anything like that. I'm, <laughs> I'm doing work. Um, but if you are listening uh, online and you'd like to send in a question, please do. You can tweet us at Kingston G Radio or at Kingston Eco One. And providing they're uh, they're all clean and they're not di you know directed at any one panelist, uh, we will we'll definitely consider reading them out. Uh, we've also had a few pre-submitted questions from local residents and uh, and people like that. Um, so thank you very much if you are listening and did send in one of them and if you are in the audience and would like to ask a question we will also uh, have a, a couple of opportunities to ask questions so um, so please do do so uh, if you if you would like a question at the end we, we'll probably do it then um, so just to introduce the panel firstly on my left hand side is uh, Professor Stephen Pollock who is also Viscount Hanworth um, he is an emeritus professor at the uh, University of Leicester in econometrics and computational uh, Statistics, which uh, I have to confess, I'm not too uh, not too clued up on. But uh, if we do delve into that, um, I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure, uh, yeah, I, I definitely don't know a lot about that. And um, and also, of course, sits in the House of Lords as a Labour member. And then to his left hand side, we have uh, Councillor Afra Brandreth. She is a Conservative Party councillor for Barnes Ward in the Borough of Richmond, um, as well as being the Conservative Parliamentary candidate for the constituency Kingston and Surbiton, which of course we are where located. Um, then to her left we have Jean Lambert, the Green Party politician. Uh, she's been a member of the European Parliament since 1999 and was also a former principal speaker of the Green Party and a former vice president of the Greens European Free Alliance Group. And that's in the European Parliament, isn't it, Jean? Brilliant. Yes, that's right. And then to Jean's left, we have Sarah Olney. Sarah is the former Member of Parliament for Richmond Park and North Kingston, and is also the parliamentary spokesperson for the seat. Thank you all very much uh, for joining us this evening. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm just going to let you kind of introduce yourselves, just say a little bit of a background. I appreciate I've done a, a short one there, and just say kind of the work you've done, of course, uh, speak about your uh, various times in politics. I know you've, uh, you've got something kindly written, um, Stephen, if you wouldn't mind just... Uh, Speaking a little bit about uh, your background in uh, in lecturing and, and things like that. Um, how much time do you want me to, to occupy? I can occupy, I think, five minutes of spiel. But um, <laughs> uh, as Henry said, I'm, I, I'm Stephen Pollock. I'm an emeritus professor of mathematical statistics. And for many years, while I was at Queen Mary College of the University of London, I, I taught a course in environmental science. Uh, and I did so in order to leaven my diet and in order to alert students to the environmental hazards uh, that we're facing today. Uh, we, we, we dealt with, with global and planned, uh, planetary issues as much as with uh, the more local issues that, are predom that predominate on, on a list of topics for discussion that has been sent to me. Um, the, the, these global topics included population growth, uh, the burden of atmospheric carbon dioxide, the acidification of the oceans and the warming of the seas, the depletion of fish stocks, the aridification of, of equatorial and sub-equatorial lands, uh, and, and the prospects for agricultural productivity. Each of these topics is beset by a current crisis. 
uh, and the overarching theme of my lectures uh, was that of planetary overload, if I can call it that. Uh, we, we can start with population growth. World population was uh, roughly 2.5 billion at the time of my birth, uh, 1946. Uh, it's now 7.7 .7 billion, which represents a, a threefold increase in my lifetime. Population continues to grow at an almost uh, exponential rate, and its absolute rate of increase uh, has never been greater. Ecologists have a riddle which uh, illustrates the startling effects of an exponential rate of growth. They invite us to imagine a pond uh, on which a weed is growing on its surface. It doubles in area every year. It began as such a small quantity that has taken half a human lifetime to cover uh, a quarter of the area of the lake. The, the question to be asked is how long will it take before the weed covers the entire surface of the lake? I'll, I'll pose that question to you. The, the, the answer uh, is that it, it will take only two more years before the whole area is covered. You can now well understand the implications of an exponential rate uh, of growth uh, in, in human population. There are, of course, some mechanisms that will bring the growth of human population to an end. Apart from the conscious will of humans, uh, these are described as Malthusian mechanisms. They include famine, warfare and disease. In the 1960s, uh, a strand of literature emerged uh, that is well represented by the book of Meadows et al. called Limits to Growth. The contributors to, th contributors to that book uh, describe themselves as the Club of Rome. The theme of the early editions of the book, and it went through, uh, I think, three or four editions, the theme of the early editions was that uh, we were in danger of running out of natural resources, uh, coal, oil, minerals, uh, agricultural land, uh, and so on. In the event, uh, we have not exhausted the supplies of minerals or of fossil fuels. In fact, these have been so plentiful that they have enabled us to foul our nest on a stupendous scale. We have burdened the atmosphere with an unprecedented concentration of carbon dioxide. We have to go back to the Permian Age uh, of about 250 million years before present uh, to exceed the current levels. We have used the mineral oils to produce a plethora of plastics uh, of which uh, we have recently become acutely aware. Uh, with agriculture, uh, there has been a similar story. Uh, the Green Revolution has, has ensured that the post-war spectre of global starvation did not materialise. Instead, we have experienced a bounty uh, that has been afforded by a combination of uh, hybrid crops, of abundant fertilisers, uh, of mechanisation uh, and of irrigation. That bounty is now at an end the salination of soils consequent upon ill-advised and misused irrigation is prejudicing the soil fertility over wide areas of the globe. Uh, to add to these hazards, we must consider the threat of, of rising sea levels that are consequent upon global warming. A one metre rise in sea level threatens to engulf some 30% of low-lying cropland in the great river deltas of the world. Uh, perhaps I, I, I've said enough to engender a sense of alarm in some of us. I can only add that uh, many people are wholly immune to such alarms. For others, such as myself, this is perhaps the most distressing uh, aspect of our current predicament. Fantastic. So, of course, a very positive message to start on this evening. <laughs> that a very serious issue that we're discussing, and, and some of the climate issues and environmental issues we are discussing, um, I think it's really important we are having a green debate, because I think too often uh, political debate at the moment is obviously about uh, Brexit and about things like that, which, of course, we will, we will touch on briefly tonight, um, I imagine, with, with some of the questions. But, um, but I think it is really important to talk about the environment. Um, Jean, I'm going to come to you next, if you wouldn't mind just, just saying a little bit about your background, some of the work you've done in the European Parliament perhaps regarding uh, environmental regulations and, and things like that? Okay, well, my, my background before getting into the European Parliament was actually in teaching. And, um, it, you know, so, but also linked very much as well sort of outside um, the classroom with the, the development of the Green Party in the UK, which took a lot of its inspiration from limits to growth, um, that we've just heard, re referred to. And I got involved in that, because to me it seemed that the political path was an ex extremely logical one, in a sense, if you wanted to actually try and change the sort of the overarching structures within which we work and the goals that, that we have. So, you know, rather than looking at, 
I remember Jonathan Porritt at one time saying, you know, OK, this year we're saving the whale, next year we're saving the dolphin, the year after we're saving the tuna fish, then it's the mackerel. <laughs> but we're not asking why it is, you know, we're having to save these creatures uh, unless you're actually looking at the political decisions that we, we make. So that was part of, you know, what got me um, into politics. And the European level, I mean, I've found... I think really in in some ways very inspiring but also exceedingly frustrating because while you're doing some of the the big picture stuff you know within sort of policies on climate change um on now the circular economy you know how we use resources more wisely we we're only just as it were beginning to touch on the economic choices that we're making and that where we invest and so on um, but within the European Parliament itself, in fact, I'm not on the Environment Committee, I'm not on the Agriculture Committee or whatever. I sit with a group of politicians from my own political family, like all families sometimes dysfunctional, but, you know, <laughs> generally we, we get on very well, so we, we share the work um, that needs to be done there. And the particular committees that I'm on are, in fact, the Employment and Social Affairs Committee and the Civil Liberties Committee. So, therefore, you, you know, part of the, the sort of, I suppose the green strand, the the specific sort of environmental strand that I've brought to in those is to do quite a bit of work on trying to push the green jobs agenda mm -hmm. about why changing the way in which we work um, and the, the training and, and the rest of it is absolutely essential to being part of that sort of transformation, that just transition um, to a different sort of world. And on the environment, uh, on the um, civil liberty side, one of the things that I do a lot of work on, apart from around immigration and asylum, but it was also on displacement and climate change, displacement of people and climate change. So that's how I try to sort of merge what people think of, I suppose, as traditionally green with actually the wide world of the overall world of politics. Brilliant. Thank you, Jean. Afra, would you mind just kind of uh, saying you know, how you got into politics and, and what your interest in, uh, in this particular subject is, perhaps? Yeah, sure, no problem. So, um, hi, I'm Afra Brandreth, and uh, as Henry's already said, I'm a councillor in Barnes and also the prospective parliamentary candidate here in Kingston. Um, going back quite a few years, I actually studied for a master's in environmental and resource economics. So, I've always been interested in um, the environment and policy making around the environment, and I actually worked for 10 years as an economic advisor in DEFRA working on a broad range of issues from sustainable consumption and production to fisheries to food policy. Um, when I moved on from working as a civil servant where obviously you are politically neutral and I was there under the Labour government and the coalition government, um, so uh, across a variety of political spectrums, I got involved in politics locally, which has been part of my journey and uh, really realising that if you want to make a difference, you actually have to put yourself forward and kind of essentially put up or shut up. <laughs> so, which is how I've ended up being here in, in this kind of position. And um, to be honest, you don't really need a master's in environmental economics to uh, understand and see the importance of the environment for all of us and the impact that things like poor air quality are having on our health. So really when I'm here tonight, I'm actually talking as a person, as somebody who lives in South West London, who's got children and who really wants to leave the environment in a better state for my children and grandchildren and so on than um, we've inherited it today. Brilliant, thank you very much. And Sarah, would you like to just give us a give us a bit of background to yourself, please? Yes, of course. Um, so I, uh, I first joined the Liberal Democrats in 2015, uh, so quite recently. My, my political history is not anywhere near as long as, as Jean's. Not um, <laughs> um, and actually, one of the reasons that, uh, that I was inspired to join uh, the Liberal Democrats is I saw out of the major parties, they were the ones who were most serious about um, really moving the environmental agenda forward. It, I think it was one of our big uh, successes in coalition government was uh, the amount of um, action we were able to take in that direction um, and uh, I got elected in the by-election in uh, 2016 and I became the Member of Parliament for Richmond Park um, and as many people will know the, 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 the biggest 
uh, environmental issue in Richmond Park is around expansion of, of Heathrow Airport, and that's been uh, a really that was a really big focus for me when I was uh, the MP. Um, and I think it's it's I'm sure we'll probably get onto that later on, but I do think it's a really interesting example of how you know we've got these really tricky decisions to make between prioritising economic growth or um, you know, improving our environment. So for me, it wasn't just the specific issue in itself, but everything that it said to us about how politics is going to uh, be tackling these issues in the years to come. Uh, so that's uh, that's been my 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 background so far. I'm uh, back working full time as an accountant now. So, <laughs> <laughs> but still, really, I'm um, you know uh, out and about uh, around. Uh, Richmond and Kingston uh, as much as I possibly can and it's interesting still I mean the the big topic at the moment the the b word that you mentioned <laughs> earlier on but beyond that the I would say that the environment comes up so often in the things that people are concerned about and there really is a growing realization out there that this is the big topic that needs to be tackled brilliant yeah we will come on to the the b word a little <laughs> bit later so if you think you'd, you'd escaped it uh, sadly not for this evening uh, so we're going to start actually on what sarah said on on heathrow expansion we had a message in from shirley on our on our uh, contact earlier um, basically saying is uh, heathrow expansion now definitely happening because i think what what a lot of people have found with the heathrow expansion is uh, that there's been debates through parliament of course local mps ed davies at goldsmith have, have been talking about it um, at quite great length but no one seems to know what the current update is is it now inevitable is it definitely going to happen so if I could start with you on that, uh, Sarah. Yeah, well, there's still a, a, a few phases to go through. I mean, the vote, there was a vote in Parliament last year which uh, approved the sort of the, the outline planning brief that, uh, that Parliament has decided upon. Um, but that's actually subject to a legal challenge, which I think is starting either next week or the week after. So four local authorities, including Richmond, um, and, and I think in, in conjunction with Greenpeace, uh, and I think possible one or two other parties have basically mounted a legal challenge to Heathrow's uh, plans to expand. And the legal challenge is mostly around air quality um, and the impact of air quality and noise on local residents and that basically the impact is so great that expansion can't be justified. So there's a legal challenge going ahead on that basis and if that legal challenge is successful, um, then I think that means that that's that. But then there's, there's, there's further, even if the legal challenge is unsuccessful and it pro uh, progresses to the next stage, there'll be a planning application. Um, and I think one can imagine that that planning application will take quite a long time to be approved. It won't get approved by what it would be Hillingdon Borough Council. Or they'll, have a, they'll have a role, but as a national, uh, as a part of national infrastructure strategy, it will be approved at a national level. So there is, there is still quite a long way to go before... Uh, spades are in the ground, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and Afra, of course, as a uh, South West London politician as well, this is something that's very much uh, in your remit. What's your kind of view on Heathrow expansion, and do you think it's uh, inevitable? Um, I definitely don't think it's inevitable. Um, as Sarah said, it's actually starting on Monday, I think, the um, case is being taken to the High Court. So, um, obviously, we'll be watching that avidly, and I am... Uh, opposed to expansion of Heathrow. I uh, sit on Richmond Council and, and have supported um, the efforts that we have been making to try and do what we can to stop it. Um, I mean, for me, I think if Heathrow does expand, I think the statistics are it's going to become the largest emitter of CO2 in the country. And I think with something like 28 million extra um, passengers visiting Heathrow, I mean, the inevitable impact on air quality and noise pollution at a time when we actually should be looking to improve our air quality just really doesn't make sense. Okay. Jean, uh, Heathrow expansion, what are your, what are your thoughts on, on that? I think I probably know as a, as a Green Party <laughs> member of the European Parliament. And, uh, and do you think it is uh, inevitable? I think you'd be really shocked if I said it was a great <laughs> idea. Yeah. Um, I, I won't be shocking you because <laughs> no, no, we don't think it's a, you know I mean, for all the reasons that that you know my colleagues have, have just stated uh, it, or around the issues around air quality, about noise. I think also about a lot of the economic assumptions that go along with it as well, um, and and I think that. Okay, I know you're parking the B word for the moment, but <laughs> I think, you know, when you consider a lot of the economic assumptions that were being made, um, which were pretty shaky, I think, even at the beginning of it, I think that would be something that we should really be sort of revisiting now um, in terms of what we think is, is going to be 
be happening and also where it fits I think within a, a general view about what are the travel priorities what is it that you want to invest in most and I, you know I'm from the east side of London so for us a lot of the questions too about the expansion of city airport mm. are you know are, are a problem I mean it was something that we opposed right at the very beginning when when it was even being built but when you look at sort of the expansion there the potential of expansion at Stansted etc you've got this whole sort of move to basically expand the um, you know air travel at a time when you know we know about a lot of the the effects as well as it's being said in terms of um, emissions so I think you know it, no it's it's not inevitable because more and more of these questions will be coming forward and yeah I, th I think that planning inquiry will mm. um, y you know will be a very lengthy one so you come back in. Yeah, I just wanted to say, because uh, at the beginning, and I was saying it's a, a symbolic of the tension between sort of economic interests and, and wanting to improve the environment. But in actual fact, as, as Jean was saying, the economic case for Heathrow expansion in itself is so very weak. It's not, there isn't even a tension there. I mean, uh, Liberal Democrat policy is actually to uh, oppose all airport expansion in the southeast, partly because we feel that the economic priority ought to be developing infrastructure in the north and in the Midlands, because there's so much more opportunity for economic growth there and so much more, um, you know, need for it. Um, but, you know, as, as Jean was saying, you look at the economic case, the business case for Heathrow, and it's really, really, really fragile. And that's why it would be such an epic mistake to go ahead with expansion, because the, uh, the environmental case is so uh, overwhelmingly against it, and there is really very little to be said in favour of it. It would be such a tragedy if, uh, if expansion was to go ahead at this stage. And Stephen, in terms of Heathrow expansion, can I get your, your thoughts on that or airport expansion? Well, yes, I mean, there, there are various layers to this. I mean, uh, we've heard about the opinions about the likelihood of the project going ahead. And quite honestly, I'm confused because uh, I, I don't know what the preponderance <laughs> of, of opinion is amongst those who uh, make decisions or, or propose to make decisions. Um, th there's then the, the, the matter of uh, its economic necessity. Well, um, perhaps we could think of, of, of uh, Heathrow somewhere else than, than uh, where it's... Uh, actually situated, which is not a very good place uh, for an airport. But um, uh, I tend to think that, that we need the infrastructure, uh, and, and this, this causes attention. I mean, mm. where do we put it? Because anywhere that you propose to put it is bound to raise uh, huge objections. Um, but I, I, I think, I think we, we, we need more infrastructure. I think we've failed to invest in such things. I'm reminded of, of flying into um, a Schiphol, in in um, Holland, and um, somebody challenged me to say, uh, "Do you really need a third London airport? Do you realise you have one, uh, and it's called Schiphol?" Uh, well, okay, I had rather mixed feelings about that because um, uh, you know they they are getting one over us uh, and uh, and wish to defeat us economically, uh, and um, well, do we need air travel? I think I think we do, uh, and for how long I don't know. But uh, so I, I, I'm dichotomized. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't want it uh, in Heathrow, <laughs> but I do want the, the airport somewhere. Uh, and um, I, I have no idea who will be prepared to accept it. Mm. And Jean mentioned uh, city airports. I think it was actually Green Party policy at the London mayor election. Sean Berry wanted to um, essentially phase out city airport in London. What, what would your thoughts be on that, Stephen? Would you, I mean, do you think central London, you know, with its awful air quality and air pollution at the moment, should be an absolute no-go for, for air travel? I think it's an appalling place to have an airport, quite yeah. honestly. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I like aeroplanes, but um, I have some trepidation when one flies in uh, quite low uh, to East London and then yeah. does an extraordinary, <laughs> but almost vertical dive. <laughs> to, to get onto that, that rather small piece of patch of, of, of ground. Uh, no, I, I think it's the wrong place utterly for an airport. Okay, fantastic. We're going to move on now to fracking. Uh, now, this is a, a very contentious issue. There are, there are some environmentalists who, who, who don't necessarily see a correlation between things like that and, and small-scale earthquakes. There are some who obviously do see that correlation and say it's a, a massive issue. Um, Gene, I'm going to come to, to you on this first. Could I get your view generally on fracking? And, of course, we've seen in recent years, um, I think particularly, particularly in some uh, northern towns and cities where, where fracking has happened and there's been mass protests against it. What, what would your thoughts be on fracking? Can there be... Uh, benefits to it well it, it's something that certainly as a as a party we we don't support um that for a whole variety of reasons i mean there there are the, the sort of the standard in environmental ones the concerns that that people have about what it does um in terms of you, you know the water use what it it's actually doing to to the earth that you, you know w within it 
but also in terms, I think, of, of the opportunity costs, that if you've decided that this is the way in which you're going, what is it then that you've decided that you're not actually going to develop, that you're not going to invest in? And I think that this is something that we're seeing in the UK with the, you know, different government decisions um, that have obviously very much backed fracking at the same time as we've seen a reduction in support, say, for you know, domestic solar or whatever. So I think there is this question about what's the overall energy policy that you want. And increasingly for us, it's to move away from um, it, it, that sort of, as it were, almost that um, background. I have, you know, people I know work within the shale industry who say, well, you know, I'm trying to sort of, you know, the fracking industry, trying to, you know, squeeze the last drops for you. And you're thinking, well, please don't bother. <laughs> um, you know, can we please, you know, invest this money into whether it's energy efficiency, whether it's renewables, you know, but rather than putting it into fracking. Okay. Stephen, in, in terms of fracking, what would your view be on it? Well, I, I'm very averse to it. I mean, uh, gas uh, is a fossil fuel, less productive of carbon dioxide than coal, but nevertheless a fossil fuel. Uh, and uh, I should um, immediately say I'm a very strong proponent of nuclear power. Uh, and I can be challenged, and perhaps <laughs> if I am, uh, I'll explain why uh, and what the potential uh, for nuclear power is uh, and how there are all sorts of potentials for doing it in a much better way with different technologies than the ones that we em employ uh, at present. But um, I think if we're going to uh, decarbonize, uh, then we've got to have uh, this uh, base load generation by, by nuclear power. Um, I'm afraid that if you, if you exceed 30% uh, of renewables, you're into a real problem of, of um, the intermittency of, of the source of power. And uh, the adjunct of uh, that proportion of renewables is, of course, backup when the wind isn't uh, blowing or the sun uh, isn't shining. Uh, and there are various uh, aspects of backup that I can discuss, uh, for example, interconnections uh, with, with um, Europe. Uh, that's also um, slightly fallacious because um, to the extent that uh, that power is generated by, by fossil fuels, uh, it's no better than, than um, uh, you know, our own fossil fuels. Uh, also, uh, to the extent that it's generated by renewables, well, the meteorology of Europe is, has a certain uniformity. So uh, when we have a dearth of renewable power, so will the rest of Europe, uh, which means that if we get our, our energy or our electricity by interconnections, it's going to be extremely expensive. So uh, my pro uh, proposition is that we, we desperately need uh, the base load generation of nuclear power, uh, and, uh, and I, can, I can argue this uh, with others mm. and, and uh, tell um, people what, what is in prospect if we really uh, grasp this, this opportunity and develop the appropriate technology. And we'll definitely bring in nuclear power, as I say, in yeah, a moment, yeah. definitely see what, what the panel's uh, view is on that. Sarah, in terms of fracking, could I get your, your opinion on whether you, um, you think there are any potential benefits to it? Uh, I can't see that there are potential benefits to fracking that there wouldn't be from other uh, sources of power that weren't fossil fuel. So, I mean, I think, you know, there's, there's far more investment we can do in renewables and as a, a source of power, um, notwithstanding what uh, Stephen was just saying about, you know, the limitations, we, we still need to get, we can still go a great deal further in that direction. And up until the point that that doesn't, uh, you know, we, we've done all we can there, um, you know, I just don't think there's any justification for investing more in, in fossil fuels. We just need to be looking far more about renewable and sustainable sources of energy, which doesn't have to be just wind and solar. There are lots of opportunities in tidal, for example. So um, I'm, I'm against fracking. Mm. <laughs> Afra, in terms of fracking, what's your view? Um, well, I think the, the kind of potential small upsides from fracking probably don't outweigh the large negative risks that um, we know exist around it and I think kind of Jean's view about it being potentially short-sighted at a time when we should be looking at investing in other renewable energy options um, is, is a view that I, I would actually share. Um, I know that there are some proposals to try and change the planning uh, policies around fracking um, and to try and bypass um, local decision makers in planning policy and I, I would definitely oppose that. I mean it just doesn't make sense that it, it would have the same planning rules for 
putting a conservatory on the back of your house as for having a huge uh, fracking project. And um, as I understand it, there's quite a few um, conservatives in Parliament who are kind of like-minded and, and putting pressure on that. And I think that we probably will see a change to that. And effectively, um, it will probably mean the end to fracking in any case, because unless you're going to get it past local decision makers, um, it, it's really not going to happen. So I, I think it's probably a bit short-sighted and we should be thinking about other other forms of energy at this point. Okay. I bring in nuclear power, which of course Stephen mentioned. Could I get your, your view on that, whether you are... Well, I'm interested to hear Stephen's yeah. view <laughs> on it. So let's maybe we should hear whether he's going to persuade us first. I mean, you know, there's obviously big... Um, issues and risks around nuclear power but I can see um, the point that Stephen is going to make which is you know we've got a, ha a huge energy demand mm. and it is one way to quite quickly produce um, the energy that we need um, so I, I'm open-minded on it I, I could see that it could be part it's not the whole answer and it's I would say mm. not the long-term solution but it'll be interesting to hear what Stephen's uh, informed view on it is? Um, yes, well, uh, I mean, you know, without a, a very plentiful supply of electricity, we're not going to be able to displace uh, the fossil fuels. Uh, we're not going to be able to electrify transport, um, motor vehicles or, or trains or whatever. So we need some form, and I can't conceive of, of any other form that's going to uh, meet the, the logistical, logistical problems. Um, and uh, the, the technology hasn't progressed uh, really since uh, since its inception. I mean, there's an interesting story about um, two versions of the nuclear reactor. Uh, one was the thorium molten salt reactor, which was advocated by a man called Alvin Weinberg, um, and it's it's a it's a beautiful system, uh, and it doesn't produce the minor actinides, the, the gunk uh, that that the pressurized water reactor does. Uh, so why do we have a pressurized water reactor as a predominant reactor in power stations? And the answer, um, you know, if I can do this sort of picaresque story, is down to a man called Admiral Rickover, because the pressurized water reactor was precisely what was appropriate for nuclear submarines, um, and I'm afraid we have that legacy now. But um, uh, the, the, there is a future if we if we had the, the technological courage, and I remember way back in time, and I'm old enough to remember this. I can remember a, a sunny day. Uh, I think it was in, in 1956. I, I remember a, a lady perched on high heeled shoes with a, um, uh, a tailored coat uh, and a squeaky voice. She was called Queen Elizabeth, and she was cutting a, 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 a ribbon at uh, Calder Hall Power Station. Now, 56. Uh, that was absolutely no time uh, after the war. I mean, it really wasn't. I don't know when you date the inception of, of the project to produce this uh, Calder Hall nuclear reactor. Um, uh, it had a, a very strong incentive because, of course, we all know, know now that the real motivation was the production of plutonium, albeit not in the Calder Hall reaction, but in, in reactor, but in, in uh, adjunct uh, and adjacent reactors. So that was what drove it. But nevertheless, uh, no time at all uh, to to produce it, and it takes uh, far longer nowadays to do. Uh, a generic design assessment than it did to build the original call to hall. Um, we've lost our courage. Um, and uh, the technology that, that could uh, um, make great headway is, is uh, a combination of what I've described, the thorium molten salt reactor, but also the fast breeder. And we have about 150 tons of plutonium sitting uh, in Sellafield. Uh, now, there are two uh, aspects to plutonium. It is thoroughly toxic. I mean, you, you simply don't want to ingest it. But it's a superb fuel, and we could burn it, uh, and it, it would be a plentiful supply of fuel for a long time. Uh, why haven't we grasped this this uh, this opportunity? And indeed, um, it's been so near to realisation. I mean, there are designs, there are uh, things that, that uh, need to be sponsored by governments. Unfortunately, we've had a, a succession of governments who are not prepared to put in uh, public money. Uh, the, the, the nostrum of, of the present incumbents is that uh, these power stations will be built with private capital, uh, and it's a nonsense. Um, and I could, I could go on, but, but maybe that's enough. Thank you very much. Um, Jean, I take it you, you have some strong views on, on nuclear power one way or another? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, it's... I think that that for, for many of us, the you know the background to it, the link with the nuclear weapons industry, 
Um, the whole questions about sort of the toxic waste that we still haven't really found a way of dealing with and that you, you know all the reassurances that go oh well we'll find a solution at some point we'll find a solution at some point keep it going um, I think you know for many of us makers you know I, I think it really becomes a, an extremely sort of worrying if not frightening scenario and that we're already in a situation it seems to me where we are leaving a whole legacy of a wrecked planet and climate change that the idea that you know we add to this with further nuclear power um, nuclear waste I think is you know just piling up the sort of you know this this literally toxic legacy for for future generations so I think you know there have been very good reasons why people have moved away from nuclear power until of course um, you know current government Labour government to some extent wanting to bring it back as well we've seen you know with within the European Union the Finnish sort of new power station that they tried which was being built as a loss leader and is now mired in all sorts of things about the finance and I know you can argue that public capital is what's necessary to build it I think for many of us there are other things that we would rather see that public investment going into rather than another generation of nuclear power nuclear power stations I think Stephen you wanted to come out yeah I'd like to jump straight back in I mean um, you you don't want global warming and you don't want uh, nuclear waste Mm. Uh, I'm afraid you know you you can have one or, or the other but uh, in order to, to overcome the problem of, of uh, carbon emissions, you've got to have a plentiful supply of, of fuel, uh, of sorry, of, of power. Uh, and it's not available, in my opinion, uh, from any other, other source. Um, I, I've, I've contended that, uh, in fact, um, uh, other technologies, nuclear technologies, could be much less uh, um, damaging in terms of, of, of the production of, of nuclear waste. And beyond that, uh, there are technologies which will actually dispose of our present nuclear waste, uh, the plutonium that I mentioned. Um, but uh, I, I've uh, just been uh, in um, China uh, looking at, at the reactor in, in Taishan, uh, which was built in, in under eight years. It's fully operational, uh, and its, it's uh, successful commissioning augurs very well for the Hinkley C, because it's precisely the Hinkley C reactor. Uh, and... Um, uh, the, the the problems of of, of uh, Alkalutu in, in Finland and, and um, uh, of Flamanville in, in in France are, are unaccountable. I, I I have been to Flamanville. Unfortunately, we couldn't get near the reactor because they they bamboozled us with all sorts of stories about the effect on local employment that the project uh, uh, was having, but wouldn't admit to us what the the problems in its construction had been. And I think the problems are simply that uh, they had no practice in building a nuclear reactors for a while. The Chinese uh, have, they've been doing it continuously, and, and Taishan was extremely, impre- extremely impressive, uh, very cleanly, um, indeed you know, a well-functioning nuclear reactor, and I think nuclear reactors do nowadays function well, uh, is, is uh, less productive of radioactivity than a coal-fired power station, that's for sure. Okay. Gene, I think, did you want to come back in, or did you? yeah, but because I I think there are there are already a sort of a, a couple of things within that which I think the issues around transparency are also part of one of the, the concerns that people have that in in terms of whether it's the funding whether it's workings whether it's the future workings whether it's who has responsibility etc for when things go wrong um, you, you know and I don't know that everybody would share you know your faith necessarily in in the the quality of chinese construction um you know looking at experience elsewhere in the world with with other construction from china that nevertheless it's also one it's another of these choices are you going to put billions potentially into a technology which it seems to me is always experimental you know, this is what we're forever being told on nuclear over the decades, um, you know, which is why you haven't got a particular pattern to roll out. Or are we actually going to put our money into other things, whether that's going to be interconnectors, whether that's going to be the battery storage, a whole set of other things where I have colleagues far more expert in this who would take you on on it. I am not an expert, but who would argue that there is a way forward which doesn't have to be nuclear, which can Mm -hmm. actually be renewables. Um, You know, so I'll pass. Sarah, would you like to to comment? Uh, uh, Just to quickly say, I mean, I I think... um, 
the way forward has to be um, you know power supplies that are not emitting carbon I think that has to be the priority and I, I, I do see that nuclear probably has a role in that I still think there are better alternatives um, and everything that um, that Jean said about the disadvantages I think sometimes those who are very enthusiastic about nuclear mm. <laughs> they do tend to skim over the fact that it does create a lot of toxic waste and that's not something we should just uh, accept and try and manage mm. uh, it's it's something that we we do need to really look it in the eye and say is it worth it and I, I, I hear what you're saying about um, you know what other alternatives are there um, potentially new alternatives in the future that hopefully we, we can develop but right now where we are right now the options on the table so I see that nuclear may well have a role but I still think investment in renewables ought to be the focus for the time being Okay. Afra, have you been convinced by the, uh, by the nuclear argument? I wouldn't like to say that I'll change my view just from one <laughs> five-minute <laughs> debate, but, um, you know, I think we've, we've heard a good balance on both sides of the argument, and, you know, I continue to see that uh, it's something we might have to consider in order to ensure that we can get the levels of um, energy that we need, but we really do need to be pursuing uh, better, cleaner, renewable sources of energy and putting our, our energies into that. And actually, you know, if we can invest in those things and be leaders in that market, it's actually a really great opportunity for us as well in the UK in terms of jobs and growth. So there's a real potential for a win-win there. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we're fast running out of time, so I'm going to go to some uh, questions that have been pre-submitted um, and uh, by certain people. And also, by the way, if you are listening uh, at home uh, on the internet, thank you very much for doing so. You can uh, tweet us at Kingston G Radio or at Kingston Eco One if you would uh, like to ask a question. So, firstly, we have a question submitted by the local MP for Kingston and Surbiton, uh, Sir Edward Davy, uh, of course, the, the former Cabinet Minister for Energy and Climate Change. Um, he, has, he has two questions. I'll ask the first one's nice and short, so I'll ask that one. Um, does the panel agree that leaving the EU, and unfortunately we have gone there now, that leaving the EU is bad for climate change? Um, we'll start, Sarah. We'll start with your uh, with your with your friend Edward. Do you agree? Do you do you think leaving the EU is bad for climate change? I think leaving the EU is bad for everything, including climate change. Um, and I think that because it, partly it just disrupts the idea. It disrupts one of the mechanisms we have for collaborating internationally on this issue uh, and on so many other issues. Um, but uh, we, you know, when once you're part of something like the EU, you can take much, uh, much greater action and, and, and working together, uh, because climate change is not a single country issue, and it can only be defeated or it can only be addressed uh, by countries working together to address some of the structural economic issues that are that are causing it. Um, and I think, as as a member of the European Union, we have so much more clout. Uh, and in, in being able to tackle some of these issues uh, that, that are contributing to climate change than we, than we can possibly do on our own. Okay. Jean, uh, I take it as well, the Green Party obviously have a very strong position uh, on, the, on uh, having a people's vote on the EU, but in terms of, without trying to kind of rerun the, the referendum arguments, uh, do you think leaving the EU would be bad for climate change? I, I, I think it, it's very, it, yeah, I mean, it, I would agree with Sarah, yeah, Yes, it's bad. It's bad because the they because of the the politics within the European Union that you can actually have that influence on other member states. And at the moment, having a country which actually has a climate change act, um, for all that there may be questions being raised about it by you know, some in the political world that that itself has inspired others to take that on, that there is this whole sort of learning process from each other. And at times as well, on policy, you actually need a group of countries that will stand together for a climate change agenda, you, you know, that actually will stand in support of the Paris Agreement, etc. And for all many of us may be extremely critical of the UK and think that, yes, we could be doing more, etc. There have been times when the UK has been extremely instrumental in influencing, positively influencing, that policy of the whole of the European Union. And therefore, if we are outside for whatever cooperation we might want to put in place, we are not part of that policy development, policy discussion and that policy push. 
So, yeah, I think, you know, that in terms of needing that strong force on... We're not talking about armies here. Don't get upset, Nigel. Um, <laughs> you, you know, that in need of having that very strong sort of... That strong voice, that strong push at the international level, the European Union is really important. And for the UK not to be part of that and doing the pushing, I think, is, is a real shame. OK. Afra, in terms of leaving the, the EU, what are your thoughts? Do you think it would be bad for climate change? I think that we need to make sure that it isn't bad for climate change and actually, you know, um, if uh, if we are leaving on the 29th of March, we need to all be working towards ensuring that we maintain our environmental standards and that we push hard and continue to be global leaders in terms of um, what we're doing for climate change. Um, you know, we face risks uh, all the time and obviously Brexit presents a large risk and we need to ensure that we don't let these potential negative outcomes happen. You know, I am an optimist and I do believe that we can actually um, have even better, stronger environmental standards and outcomes and actually that's about... Um, all parties committing to ensuring that that happens and you know the Conservative Party have said that they are uh, committed to not just maintaining the status quo but actually Im improving environmental standards once we leave the uh, European Union and you know I think that that's what we've got to do we've got to be reactive to the situation we're in and make things better and make sure that things do improve. I want to pick you up, Jean, on something you said uh, just then about, of course, environmental standards, because uh, do you accept the argument that some people may say that we could have better environmental standards outside the EU? The only reason I say that is because, of course, one of the most prominent Green Party politicians, of course, Baroness Jones, who is in the House of Lords, um, was, was a strong advocate for leaving. And of course, I imagine is a, is a friend of yours or an ally of yours in the party. Um, I mean, do you, do you kind of accept her view, wh whether or not you agree with it or not? Because, of course, we are leaving. Do you think there, there are positives potential positives we could unlock? I find it very difficult to think of any, um, <laughs> and this is a discussion that we have had. Um, <laughs> that, yeah, I do find it difficult to, you, you know, because the idea that sort of somehow it all it's needed is, is for us to be, I don't know, liberated, to be able to go further, faster, is total rubbish. You, you know, because... In virtually every piece of legislation, there is always that possibility of a go further clause. There is absolutely nothing to stop you sort of reaching your renewable energy target sort of two or three years ahead and pushing to go further rather than simply saying, oh, well, we've done that early. We don't need to do anything now. Let's polish our nails or whatever the, the political equivalent is. So, you know, I, I really think that, you know, being outside great if we manage to do that i think that is a real challenge for every um environmental activist in this country to make sure that if that is what the government is saying and if we're leaving that's then the outcome okay. you know because they've got nobody else to hide behind then sarah you wanted to come in yeah just very quickly i mean i think it's always uh, from the very start since we've known the referendum result, the biggest problem is that we really have no clue, and we still don't, 23 days or however long it is till the 29th of March, we still don't know what the government's intentions are for after Brexit. And, you know, uh, Baroness Jones may be right that, that, you know, there might be opportunities uh, you know, after Brexit to, to do something about climate change. We have absolutely no idea what the government intends to do. Um, and that is why we've always been pushing for a people's vote, because we need we, what we've been saying is, let's get it all down, at, you know, out on the table. Let everybody see what your plans are, what your intentions are. Once we've left the European Union, what is it that you want to do next? And, and, and as far as... That's kicking the can down the road, though, Sarah, just by, by having a people's vote, you know, doesn't that kind of add to the uncertainty that we, that we have at the moment? Well, no, because what we've been saying is that we want a people's vote on, on the government's deal and what is it exactly that they plan to do? What is it that they want to achieve out of Brexit? And that's been so missing from the debate on, on every aspect mm. um, up till now. But, um, uh, you know, what exactly does the government intend to do with environmental regulations after Brexit? It really has said nothing at all. And I think we need to know that before we make a final decision as to whether that's a better path for us than remaining in the European Union. Okay. Afra, do you want to defend your, uh, <laughs> your party? <laughs> Well, I only want to make a couple of quick points. I mean, um, Parliament has already legislated for EU laws to be translated into um, 
UK law. So, I mean, you know, it, it everything will move over. So uh, that has that has actually been done. And to say that the Conservative Party haven't said what they want to do is is not true. They've got a 25 year environmental. Uh, plan and um, they've made a commitment to in fact ensure that this is the first generation that leaves the environment in a better state than they found it. So I think that gives quite a clear indication of what um, of what the government's intentions are. I think the only thing I wanted to raise at this point, it would be interesting to hear what others on the panel think, is the potential opportunity of the common agricultural policy and putting um, the <coughs> current, uh, I think it's four billion pounds worth of spending and, and using that to ensure that actually we can see improvements in uh, environmental stewardship and, and that potentially is an opportunity to see um, improvements to, to the environment. Mm. Stephen, you uh, well, I would just add to that that there are great changes in the um, European uh, agricultural policy at the moment, uh, and they're moving in the same way as, as I think that uh, we are proposing to move under a Brexit scenario. But uh, one of the reasons for the imponderability of, of, of um, uh, these issues is that we don't know whether we're going to leave with a deal or without a deal. And I sit on the on the Energy and Environment Committee of the House of Lords, and um, we're dichotomised between uh, two uh, Scenarios: One is, is if, if they live, leave without a deal, uh, we'll have no, nothing to do with the uh, emissions trading scheme. Uh, and the emissions trading scheme is a, a scheme that's pan-European, and in fact uh, it owes its existence to British advocacy. Uh, and it's absolutely tragic, in my view, that having uh, worked so hard uh, on, on these issues uh, and promoting all sorts of environmental instruments, uh, we're, we're backing away uh, and uh, prejudicing the, the, the viability of the emissions trading scheme by our absence. Uh, and uh, we'll have no possibility for establishing the thing uh, as a native emissions trading scheme because we're too small. Um, we'll have to revert to a carbon tax. Um, and I, I don't think there's anything that I've heard uh, um, in the last 10 minutes that, that, that I would disagree with whatsoever. I mean, it, it, this whole thing is, is tragic and uh, Brexit is not good for, for the environment uh, in spite of, of um, you know, what... Uh, your party has uh, been proposing. Um, Michael Gove uh, is, um, you know, a, a now a strong advocate for all sorts of, of good things. But um, uh, I'm wondering whether he really has the support of the rest of the party. Perhaps you should get in there and influence <laughs> them. I think we are going to move on from the from the EU and Brexit for a moment, just because uh, I think we, we've all heard enough in the in the current media about that. Uh, this is a question submitted by uh, Orlando Orlando Jenkinson, rather. He's a reporter for the Surrey Comet. Um, he actually submitted two again. People are asking two questions rather than one, but I'll, I'll go with his second one. Um, and so it says, should we all be following Greta Thunberg and join the growing climate, climate strike movement? Now, I have confessed, I didn't know who that was. So I did look it up, and it's a, a Swedish activist who, and of course, we've, we've seen across the country uh, movements like Extinction Rebellion, and we've seen um, the, uh, I know there's, there's uh, Birth Strike, which has just launched. I don't know if you've seen, but it's uh, some people who are who will not be having babies, uh, uh, refusing to have, have children until the, the current crisis is, uh, is sorted out. Um, and uh, and of course we've seen uh, I think it was a few weeks ago where a some school children walked out of their classes uh, to protesting against uh, climate change generally. Um, I just want to get your thoughts on this because um, you know we're, we're discussing it here, of course, green issues, but it isn't really discussed in the media. Of course, with regards to Brexit as well, dominating the agenda, we don't talk about it. Um, Groups like Extinction Rebellion do get criticised for their tactics. For instance, you know, they do block roads and they do cause disruption. Um, but does the panel agree that um, that would be a good way, or that is a good way, to get climate change into the national debate? Sarah, can I start with you on that? Do you, in terms of those, those kind of direct action tactics, do you have any sympathy? Uh, I do. I absolutely do. Um, I think my observation for having been in Parliament and discussing the, the issue of Heathrow expansion is that our current system of politics is very, very poorly set up for making good decisions about climate change. It's not even it's not even talking about it. I mean, we've obviously all just talked about how Brexit is pretty much squeezing the oxygen out of any other issue. But um, it, the, the party political system, particularly the sort of the very uh, combative nature of politics, it really doesn't allow for effective decision making on this particular issue. Um, and neither of the two main parties see a political advantage in, in championing the green cause, if you know what I mean. 
Um, and and that's why uh, and then that's why it's not being talked about. And I know with Heathrow, I was surprised to find so many supporters of it on both sides until I came to realise that actually their funding comes from people whose interests lie in expanding the airport, business for the Tories and unions for Labour, and that is why. And I think that is a massive, massive obstacle to getting um, green uh, the, the green agenda, as it were, being more widely discussed in Parliament. I thought the school climate strike was, was brilliant, um, and uh, it's absolutely... A way, and then it's not just that you know about getting it on the agenda and getting headlines and and politicians then needing to react to those headlines, but it's actually about people feel that they can make their own contribution, they can get involved in protests and so on, and I think that's really important, especially for young people. Um, I have to say, I was so disappointed in the prime minister's reaction when she said, "Well, they should all be in school, uh, and they should all be learning how to be engineers and scientists, so they can solve this problem in the future." And it was like, "No, you should be solving this problem now." So difficult to be looking for technological solutions; they're going to magically appear just in time to uh, to solve these problems for us. So, um, so I, yeah, I think I, I, I absolutely. I, I mean, I would, would slightly caveat that with you know. Um, you know, direct action that isn't actually, you know, committing violence against property or against people. I clearly couldn't advocate for that. But, you know, finding a way to grab the headlines um, and because that is a very effective way at getting politicians to respond. And, and we had uh, a debate in Parliament last week called by uh, Leila Moran from the Liberal Democrats on climate change, and it was the first time it had been discussed in Parliament for two years. And it was very poorly attended, which was unfortunate. It's a Thursday. Lots of MPs are in their constituencies, and it was a, a backbench opposition debate. It was never going to get a huge amount of time, but we do need to keep, keep the pressure on and keep the pressure on the government. Stephen, do you have any uh, sympathy for, for groups like Extinction Rebellion who try direct action and how do you think we can best get climate change and environmentalism into the national debate? Well, I, I don't know this particular group, but I think the question is uh, what is an appropriate or, or a legit legitimate form of protest? Um, and uh, um, I think we should militate in every which what way, uh, given the, the, the dimensions of, of the problems we are facing. Um, you know, the, uh, again, the same caveats. That one doesn't want violence and one doesn't want the destruction of property and so on. All these things could be counterproductive. But um, I think, uh, you know, most of, 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 of uh, what seems to be um, happening is, is absolutely laudable. Uh, and I have no hesitation. Okay. Gene, in terms of direct action, I mean, uh, you know, I think Jonathan Bartley for the Green Party has uh, previously been in trouble by the police for some of his protests and arrested and things like that. And it's, you know, it's it's certainly a form of, of protest uh, that, that people in the Green Party have, have done in the past and, and environmental groups. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, well, I think nonviolent direct action, you know, has its place. And I think it's also important to point out that people who engage in it are also generally willing to take the consequences. I think that that's a really important thing to understand that, you know, if you consider the way in which it's, it's been used, that um, I think that one of the things that, that's happening now with the student strike, I mean, it, you see it every Thursday in Brussels, it's 35,000 kids now out on the streets, um, you, you, you know, and I think some of the schools have worked on the basis that if you can actually produce a selfie to show that you were on the demonstration <laughs> and not, you know, down the park with your mates, um, you know, that is sort of taken as, as your civic engagement, which I think is quite an interesting way to look at it. But I think it, it's also the thing that, that it, it, you know, that alone isn't going to make the difference. That's the sort of, if you like, the wake-up call. That's the thing that, that will grab attention, but it's also then how do you focus and how do you move this on? So that if you've got kids out in school strike, what else are they doing? What are they demanding in their school? What's the discussion about how the school is working? What's the discussion with their local authority? The, you know, and there I think that if we're looking at a, a model of engagement which brings results is the, the Citizens UK model of sort of active citizenship, you know, where you're really talking to the decision makers with a very specific idea of what the changes are that you want to happen. Because otherwise it gets to the point where you think we've been out there, we've been doing this, nothing has changed. So it's how do you link the nonviolent direct action, the protest side, with then actually trying to make sure that change happens. And whether that's, you know, in your trades union, in your workplace, um, you, you know, whatever it is, 
what are the changes that you're trying to make? And you'd hope that would filter into the national debate, is that? And then you, you make you make sure mm. that yeah. it, it comes in either into the national debate or at least into the surgeries, the mailboxes, etc., of your elected representatives so that people cannot say, nobody ever writes to me about this, nobody ever raises it on the doorstep. <laughs> you, you know, I mean... OK. And, and your view on the on the climate uh, change protests generally, I mean, do you have any sympathy or...? Um, so I, I think peaceful protest is, of course, um, something that, you know, is definitely a way of raising awareness. I think, actually, when we consider the issue more broadly, we need to think about changing the language sometimes that we're using when we talk about environmental issues and actually um, getting the message out there in a way that is easier for people to kind of grasp what we're talking about. Because when you start talking about... Uh, emissions and you know levels of no2 emissions or co2 emissions doesn't actually translate necessarily for people and of course we all know about the amazing blue planet program that david attenborough did using images getting actually um environmental impacts out there in a really visible understandable way completely galvanized people's understanding and, and support of an issue so i think we really need to be considering uh, it, as a whole how we kind of communicate and deal with these issues and hopefully to get people more engaged mm. I can't remember how quickly this has gone but we're coming to the end of the uh, of the uh, of the show just going to ask the floor for a couple of questions uh, councillor sumner i know you had a question uh, of course councillor sumner is the uh, the green party councillor for kingston council hi um, i was quite disappointed to read in the sorry comments that the leader of kingston council isn't going to be following the other 30 brave councils that declared a climate emergency. Um, and I just thought, given that so much can actually be implemented on a local level in regards to, to climate policy, anything from encouraging council contractors not to use pesticides, um, local planning, uh, local plans, and also planning, um, planning policy. Um, how, well, how does the council, how do the, um, sorry, how did the panel feel about the um, all of those brave councils including Richmond actually that declared a climate emergency Thank you very much. Just uh, for the benefit of those listening at home who may not have heard that, um, so we're, we're talking about this, this uh, I don't want to call it a trend, because obviously not many councils have done it so far, but there are uh, an increasing number of councils calling a climate emergency. This is something that um, Orlando, uh, the journalist from the Surrey Comet, uh, messaged in about as well, and he did also add on his point, the IPCC says in, a, in its October 2018 report that humanity has 12 years to present catastrophic climate breakdown um, that could pr prove irreversible and threaten the existence of life on earth he uh, also points out that wiltshire council was one of those councils to acknowledge a climate emergency and uh, many councils in the uk have also pledged to going carbon neutral by 2030 um gene what are your thoughts on that do you think we should be encouraging local councils uh, to declare this climate emergency and uh, I, I probably know the answer to that question so why why do you not think it's happened so far well i i think it is something that you, as you say you, you know we're seeing more and more councils doing it I think part of it is that for councils to do it, they also then want to do it in, in, and feel that they're going to take this seriously. And I think at, at the moment where you're looking at the enormous funding pressures on councils, I think a number of them will be really worried about, you know, what are the financial implications of this? What are they, you know, what's going to be expected in a term, time when they're, they're actually having real difficulty delivering on you know social care and and so many other things but i think that you know part of the the move for this is, is to say that we want to speed up the the agreements that we already have we want to you know and one of the ways in which you can do that of course is about public engagement and there are a lot of things where if you look at the budget effect of them you, you know if you're looking at sort of um some of the the, the sort of the money that might be available to to change the the sort of the transport, um, the, you know, within your own local area, the the sort of the shift to walking and cycling, all of these sorts of things. To you know, I think it, there's there's more that can be done there. And of course, the more councils that do it, the more others feel encouraged to be able to take this on because it's something we can work on together, and to show that it doesn't all have to come from government. 
down it actually can come from you know that change and that impetus for change mm. can be the local level up as well okay upper of course is the only councillor on the panel what, mm. what's your view on councils potentially declaring a climate emergency do you think kingston should declare one here do you think perhaps I mean, I think we need to be working locally at London level and nationally. There isn't one single solution that's going to solve all of our environmental issues. So, um, and of course, looking locally is an important place to start. Um, and uh, as was pointed out, there are lots of things that we could be doing locally in terms of making sure that if there's contractors that we're using, that they are potentially you know, complying to certain environmental standards. We should really be doing more in terms of making sure that big, uh, big stakeholders locally are also buying into what our strategy is. So in terms of um, whether it's solar energy or um, more green walls, planting more trees, you know, everybody needs to be engaged in, in what we're trying to achieve. So yes, starting at a local level, but it's local, it's London wide and it's national and there's not just one, one silver bullet answer. Okay. Sarah? Um, well, I think the priority for Kingston Council right now is to really do something about air quality in Kingston. Uh, Cromwell Road in particular is actually one of the worst roads in London for air quality. And I know that that's the absolute focus for Kingston Council. Um, and they're going, they're doing much more and they're doing, going further and faster than uh, the previous Tory administration did on this because it is such a critical priority. Um, and, you know, th th there's, there's a great deal going on. Um, in terms of looking to really tackle car use in the borough, which is really important, get more people out on their cycles. They're going to plant a thousand trees across the borough in uh, in the four years uh, or in the next three years. Um, so I think that's the absolute urgent priority, not just for Kingston, but for councils right across London, um, that will really you know get to grips with with air quality and uh, and to address that particular issue. Which isn't to say that the other aspects of climate change. Aren't, um, aren't a priority, but you know, Jean's mentioned really, really squeezed budgets. And I mean, for most local authorities, that's an absolutely critical level. Um, and I think to kind of like be focusing on the air quality target is the right priority for mm. now. Okay, and Stephen? Well, yes, I mean, uh, councils should have a great deal of leverage and, and many of them have shown a keen awareness of environmental issues. But I mean, Jean has, has put her finger on it. I mean, they are so uh, strapped for cash now that they have very little room for manoeuvre. And I mean, one of the things that, uh, that they should be doing, for example, is is in immediately uh, setting out to replace uh, fleets of vehicles that are that are uh, you know noxious and, and uh, um, produce lots of of, of uh, uh, bad air. But um, they don't have the funds, and I think um, something radical uh, has got to happen to 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 give power back to the, to, to local decision makers uh, because um, they should have the leverage, but uh, they're totally hamstrung. Mm. And just finally, because unfortunately we have come to that to that point already yeah. where we're where we've only got a few moments left. Um, this was submitted by James, who of course is in the audience over there. Uh, he says, "Do the panel agree that policies currently being pursued by a number of local authorities to plant hundreds, if not thousands, of trees, whilst making the streets more attractive, does not contribute to significantly improving air quality, as evidence from the London Air Quality Network suggests?" Um, Sarah, what what are your thoughts on that? Um, I haven't seen that, so I don't know. I can't comment. Uh, but I just think uh, uh, making, uh, just in terms of making it a more attractive and a, a more pleasant place to live, I'm obviously very in favour of more trees. I think they have a beneficial impact on the environment. Um, I can't comment, as I say, on, 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 uh, on, that, on that particular finding, but um, it can't be a bad thing. <laughs> okay, Jane? Yeah, I think it depends what you what it is you 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 want them to do. And I mean, I've seen um, some of the questioning about how it works with air quality, but on the other hand, it's not the only reason that you're planting trees. Um, if you're interested in biodiversity, if you're interested in how do you actually sort of provide a cooling environment, um, it, you know, in within your your area, if, and how do you make um, I know your tree, your 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 streets feel different. There are a whole set of really good reasons to be planting trees, and that if you're looking at how it links with air quality and the potential sort of barrier side of that, then I think you know that comes into what sort of trees is it that you're planting, and that if we're looking at sort of you know amazing sort of sort of 
tree initiatives in the world. Uh, one at the moment is Pakistan with its 10 billion tree tsunami, as they call it. They've already planted 2 billion in, in one of the provinces, Khyber Pathunkhwa, in the past. The government there now really taking on climate change, 10 billion, you know, and that's, that's fast. You know, and this has become something which has really energised people to actually start thinking about the environment, start thinking about climate, and it's something that people can do, you know, which is very, very practical. And as I say, given that we also have a biodiversity crisis at the moment, you know, trees and, and what it is that we're actually planting are a really important consideration as well. Okay. Stephen, on the, on the subject of planting trees? Well, I'm all in favour of greening our urban environment. I, I'm most surprised at this uh, assertion that um, planting trees has little effect on the quality of air. Uh, I, I find this counterintuitive, and I'd like to, to uh, chase down this, uh, this assertion and see what backs it up. But um, no, I mean, I, I'm utterly in favour of, of um, planting trees uh, in the urban environment. I'm in favour of, uh, of fixing carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. Uh, I, I, wonderful. Mm. And just to finish off, Afra, what, what are your thoughts? Um, my thoughts are, I love trees. I need more <laughs> trees. So um, I'm, I'm happy to see trees planted. But I think the point was, do we need to be thinking a bit bolder and more ambitious? And yes, we do need to do that. I mean, there are things that can be done in London. For example, retrofitting buses so that they're all zero emissions. I think something like a quarter of uh, NO2 emissions by 2020 on London roads is coming from TFL buses. So, I mean, really, we've got to get a grip of this and move faster. But yes to trees, love trees. Brilliant. Well, that brings to a close the Great Green Debates. Firstly, from our studio audience, very thank you for coming. Could you give a, a quick round of applause to our panel this evening? <laughs> um, it's never easy to organise these debates and obviously to do it on a, on a subject like the environment, but I hope you'll agree that we've had a really fantastic set of politicians on the panel this evening um, and for them to give up their time on a, on a wet and cold Wednesday evening is very much appreciated. Um, just to move on to a couple of other things, the reason we're doing this is because Kingston Green Radio, as Jean mentioned at the start, uh, is turning 12 years old, which is remarkable. Um, we've got another special event taking place on Friday. We're doing a panel event for International Women's Day. Um, that's hosted by Jean and will be a similar format if you'd like to come along please do feel free um, just just let us know give us an email or, or just pop in and let us know you'll be coming along um, on the panel for that we've got Siobhan Benita who ran for Mayor of London in 2012 um, as she's running again in 2020 she was an independent she's now uh, become a Liberal Democrat she's officially confirmed as the Lib Dem candidate and um, we've also got Liz Green who of course is the uh, leader of Kingston Council um, and also a councillor in Surbiton we've got Deborah Walls who is the executive head teacher of the Coombe Federation so she looks after Coombe boys and Coombe girls um, obviously very inspirational woman in the borough she's done a lot of uh, really good work for, for Coombe uh, as a kind of school academy trust um, and then also on the panel we have Michelle Akintoy who is the founder and CEO of Brita Freak I think I'm saying that right um, and it is a, a uh, organisation which basically looks to give young people in education mentors so that will be another fantastic panel uh, that's taking place at 6.30 on Friday so as I say if you want to come along please do feel free and uh, just two other points obviously we have filmed this event so it will be up on YouTube afterwards um, if you would like to uh, watch it back or if you're listening at home and, and would like to see the, the lovely faces of the panel uh, instead of just listening to them and uh, and finally just let you know um, we, we obviously run by donations here at, uh, at the Kingston Environment Centre and uh, if you have enjoyed what you've heard this evening, if you're listening at home or if you are here, please do feel free to, to leave a donation. You can do so on our website, um, which is it's the, on the front page of the website. There's a donation tab. Um, or, of course, feel, feel free to, to leave a, a couple of quid here if you do fancy it. But once again, thank you very much for coming. And, uh, and yeah, uh, let's, let's hope the environmental crisis uh, at least improves at the moment. Thank you.